Okay, can you hear me? Fantastic. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me again. I was here five years ago, and after the pandemic, it feels 500 years ago, basically. And it's a great pleasure to be here. We started Eleven about two years. We just raised our seed round with strong support from the Gates Foundation and other investors. As I mentioned, we have offices both here in Cambridge. This is why I relocated to London for this year. Beautiful, really enjoyed it so far. And uh, we have offices also in Tel Aviv and in Boston. So I would like to start with the vision of our company. And that's the vision for our company. What you see over here, this photo. And just to annotate, this photo is a female scientist programming an RNA-based drug using combinatorial chemistry and AI. Now, the vision is not the photo. The vision is how this photo was created because not a human, not a single like designer created this image for me. I just typed the sentence that you see over here on the slide. I typed it into DALI2, which is an AI tool that is now publicly available. And after a few seconds, the computer produced this image for me, which is quite realistic image. There is like, you know, it looks like a female scientist doing something like something important and sophisticated. And I'm sure that most of you have seen already on social media examples of DALI and, and you, maybe some of you used it already. And to this point, we became kind of like almost not exciting by the possibility that a computer, you type a sentence into a computer and it produces a photo for you. I just remember my days 30 years ago, kind of like, you know, using computers. If someone would tell me that, that would be kind of like, you know, how to like blew my brain away. But now we're kind of like so used to it that it's not exciting anymore. So I want to re-excite you and just to tell you about the level of difficulty for the computer to produce this image because this image consists of 1,024 pixels on the Y-axis, 1,024 pixels on the X-axis. So together we have over 1 million pixels. In each pixel, you need to select out of 65,000 colors. So the computer needs to select something if you think about all these different types of colors in basically 65 to the power of over 1 million possibilities. And it needs to go and somehow magically screen through all these possibilities and to find these few images that will match the sentence that I put. Now the number of possibilities is one and more than one million zeros after it, more than all the particles in the universe. And somehow this magic happens in a few seconds after you put the prompt. And the way to do that, basically how the computer does it, and, and we discussed it in the previous session, is really the magic of AI. You take a lot of data, in this case, images and prompts, and you kind of like subject it to your AI system. Then the AI system maps the latent space. It builds a model, some internal model representation of these images and prompts. And then after it builds the model, you can now ask it, please generate a new one, simple from this model. And here is the text, give me a new image. And that's the beauty of AI. And I think it's a common thread in all the talks we heard so far. So I'm now about five minutes into my talk and I didn't tell you about RNA therapeutics. Now, the thing is that you, I guess most of you already, and, and one, just one, one thing to mention is that the ability to generate to train this model is by a massive amount of data by screening all these different photos online and be able to train the model. So let me tell you about RNA therapeutics. The thing is that most of you already got at least one RNA therapeutics in the past, which is the vaccine. In the case of the vaccine, we have, we basically give the mRNAs, the therapeutic agent. It recruits the ribosomes in your body and instructs them to produce a protein, in the case of the vaccine, the spike protein. So this is how the vaccine works. But in fact, there are many classes of RNA therapeutics. CRISPR, for instance, is another class of RNA therapeutics. There is a gRNA that guides the Cas9 to a specific location in the genome in order to cut it. And there are many, many more, and some of which like CRISPR and RNAi, uh, the, the people that discovered this therapeutics uh, or this modality won the Nobel Prize. So it's a quite powerful technology. And if I want to summarize the word of RNA therapeutics, it's quite simple. The active pharmaceutical ingredients is an RNA molecule. This molecule goes into your body and programs a specific enzyme. 
And then this enzyme changes the expression, increases, decreases, put a new one uh, of a particular gene that we want. This is how this this, all these classes of therapeutics work. And the most important part, the most important, important word in this slide is the word program, because this therapy gives you the ability to program these molecules in digital precision. In RNA, we have four building blocks, A, C, G, and U. And I can pull these building blocks like Lego bricks. I can put them one after the other to create any molecule that I want. And then boom, I can get the vaccine. In fact, this is the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, what you see over here. This is how it looks like. Now contrast that to other types of drugs that you know, for instance, morphine. This is how it looks. If you want to change it, to change the activity, maybe to become much more uh, potent, then, which this one will create basically a heroin, this will be by this like analog changes to the molecule. And if you get codeine, this would be, a, sorry, oxycodone, this would be another change to these molecules, another analog change. Not this like this digital discrete changes, but tiny changes to this molecule. But here is a problem. If I give you an mRNA, your body naturally resists these molecules. Because RNA molecules, your body thinks they are viruses. Many viruses actually are RNA viruses, right? SARS-CoV-2, influenza, RSV. So your body evolved a series of mechanisms to resist foreign RNA molecules. It will create, if you basically put an mRNA with these nucleotides, it will create local inflammation. The protein, the body will try to chop this RNA as fast as it can, and it will be very weak response. You just get inflammation without any therapeutic benefit. And also it's hard to deliver it into the body. However, about 15 years ago, Catalin Carrico and Drew Weissman had an epiphany. They said, okay, what if we'll take this mRNA molecules, this nucleotide over here, this uridine, and we will change it, we'll do some changes to this uridine. And now the uridine becomes like just tiny atomic changes to the uridine. And suddenly, if you now take this mRNA molecule and inject it, it's not as inflammatory as the regular mRNA. It stays for a longer time. It creates the protein. So this one will just give you misery and suffer. And this molecule, if you use this type of nucleotides, N1 methyl pseudouridine, suddenly you can give it to more than 60 billion doses. So these tiny changes can create a huge uh, uh, change in the, in the mRNA. And so although this, we think about this RNA therapeutics as software, the hardware really matters. And the hardware are the nucleotides that we use the chemical structures of them. But here is kind of like the exciting slash problematic part. This is only one type of change that you can introduce to the molecule, what I'm showing you here on my left, your right. There are many other types of changes that you can introduce. You can introduce changes to the sugar base. You can introduce changes to the um, phosphate backbone. And you can even change totally the topology of these nucleotides, of your building blocks. And we know today about more than 100 possible changes that we can introduce to these nucleotides. And the question is, what are the best combinations of nucleotides that we need to use in order to create the best therapeutic effect? Now, just think about the scale of the problem. Let's say a gRNA for CRISPR is 42 nucleotides. Let's say that in each position, I just contemplate between two types of nucleotides, of two types of chemical modifications. So that's basically 42 to the power, so it's two to the power of 42 possibilities over one billion, one trillion options that you can have to find the best molecule. But I showed you before that the computer, if I have enough data, I can train my AI system to screen many, many more options and to come up with very good solutions. And that's our vision. I want to be able to train an AI system with a lot of data about this, the uh, chemical modifications and to learn a model that will allow me to predict the best molecules. So I showed you this slide before, but now instead of talking about photos on the internet, 
what we want to do is to introduce a large number of molecules and to learn from the structure activity relationship of these molecules. And for that, we build this platform in our company called Terra, which is an end-to-end -end solution to use DNA encoded libraries to really do this trick, to learn the structure activity relationship of RNA molecules. And let me kind of like double click on that and explain you how this thing works. Ewan described before, like before this session how they used all the publicly available data from proteins to train alpha fold. For chemical modifications, we don't have these types of data sets. And part of the problem is that just to train one, like to take one data point costs about 20 to $100. And if I want now to train on 1 billion data points in a regular strategy, I will run out of money quite quickly, It'd be bankrupt. Very so we need to find a much better way to produce a massive amount of data. And for that, we turned into combinatorial chemistry. So it's a really cool thing. We start with this kind of like solid supports, okay? We take these solid supports, think about this as kind of like Lego plates that we can start building on these Lego plates. Then we split them into two parts. In one part, we'll introduce one type of nucleotide, and in the other part, we'll introduce the other type of nucleotide. And we just click them using our chemistry into this Lego support. Now we mix the support together, and we have a mixture. And then at random, I'm going to take this solid support and again, split it into two parts. I take now each part and again, I introduce each one of the nucleotides that I would like to evaluate and click them again. It's Lego, so I can keep doing that. And then I can, now what happens is at that point, it's quite interesting because quarter of your Lego supports will have the blue Lego brick, quarter of your Lego supports will have just the two orange Lego bricks and quarter will have half and half in different orders, right? Each one of the quarters. So you get all different possibilities. And then you can keep doing that. You can pull it again, keep doing split and pull, split and pull. And then at the end, you will build all your molecules. And of course you don't do it with four supports. You just do it with many more. And I ran out of ink in this slide, so I just didn't do more, but there are many, many more. And just to give you the scale, because all these reactions are actually at the molecular level, they're super small. So to do that, we basically I can generate 10,000 different reactions. And just to do that, I can do it with, see if I, I don't, don't have it here with myself, sorry. I have like in this tiny tube, I can actually put all these reactions to, actually I do have it. Sorry, it was, yeah. I can put all these reactions in this tube over here, over 10 million molecules. Now you maybe don't see a lot in this tube. That's exactly the point. It's super small. So I can generate 10 million molecules very effectively. And then I can take these molecules and I can evaluate them with cells, see the effect of these molecules, and then train my my model, and again, build these new molecules, measure them in cells, train my model, and keep doing this virtual cycle of AI in order to learn the structure activity relationship of between RNA modifications and their activity on, um, on cells. So we use this platform now to develop, to find these chemical modifications that will allow me to target these molecules for different types of organs, to also increase their stability right now with the vaccine, the spike protein is only stays for a few days in your body. Can we find the right chemical modifications to let this protein stay for much longer? It doesn't affect the vaccine, but any therapeutic mRNA to stay for a very long time and also to discover new building blocks that will give us new types of biology with these molecules. So with that, I'll finish my talk. Thank you so much.